Well, in order to properly introduce uh, today's guest, I have to uh, tell a little personal story. As uh, you viewers know, I'm nothing more than just a disc jockey who likes to read free books. And uh, I was uh, sitting with my fiance, a um, couple of her friends, and they inquired about my uh, upcoming interviews on the Big Book Show. And I said, uh, well, you know, I'm reading this book, The Lion is In. It's really interesting. I, it's, I really like the way it's written. It's, uh, I think it may be more uh, for women, but I'm, I'm really cool with that. And it's, yeah, it's uh, interesting. I, I'm digging it. I like the way things are happening. I go up three quarters of the way through. And uh, who wrote it? Well, Delia Efron. I'm like, what? What, what? what are you talking about? And of course, then I was uh, uh, pointed out to me that uh, this is the author who wrote uh, several incredible books, and, which also turned into movies. Uh, You've Got Mail, The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I mean, it just goes, the list goes on and on. So here it is. The line is in. Uh, Daily Efron, welcome to the show. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. I have to say, I enjoyed it. This is, uh, and I read a lot of uh, what, what I egregiously call uh, chick books. Uh, but having grown up with uh, with, wom with women, uh, this really, I mean, it appealed to me. This is really a story. Um, I'd say it's kind of four love stories. We've got uh, three women, uh, but then there's uh, there's also a well, there's a lion involved as well, <laughs> and there's this interesting yeah. uh, relationship between them. And I'm not quite sure how to discuss this book, um, what, how, how do you usually, in, uh, what is your ele elevator version of what this book is about? Well, my editor says it's Thelma and Louise Cross were born free. So we'll make this <laughs> okay, <a> yeah. <laughs> but that's three women on the run, uh, and uh, they each have secrets the others don't know, and two are in their 20s, and, and one is an older woman in her 50s, and it's really about uh, what you can run from and what you can't, and the power of an animal to change your life. And it was so interesting that, as I said, around three quarters of the way through the book, then we get the backstory on these women, and then it really starts to open up. Like, ah, okay, now I understand why she's acting like this. And they all—they all are. Although two of them are really good friends, they're—you know—they're kind of strangers in the way. They really don't know that much about each other. It seems at point at times. They don't know the big secrets that I think that people always have secrets from each other. And in this case, they Lana and Tracy are best friends since they've been little, but they don't know the big... S Lana doesn't know what Tracy, who is a kleptomaniac, has been up to, even though she's a kleptomaniac and she knows that. And, and Lana, who's wrestling with uh, issues of trying to be sober, but is still stuck with her personality from when she wasn't sober. You know, she's still needs drama, she still wants to make trouble, and she's got a lot of guilt that's influencing how she's behaving. And then, of course, Rita, they don't know. They've met Rita on the road, and they don't know that she's run away from her minister husband, and they don't know what happened with him. So the relationship with the lion, which, you know, is, it, it's happenstance, really, you know, there's just a lion that happens to be in a bar, and these beautiful relationships starts. Uh, where did you come up with that? Is this something when you're writing, it's just like, I know it, I'm going to put a lion in this story, it's going to work out perfectly? No, 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 it didn't happen like that. But I just want to say that the reason they find a lion is that their car breaks down on a rural high right way in North Carolina, and they break into a bar and into a bar with the lion. But I had this dream. I had it. it. I dreamed this story. These three women in a bar with a lion. It was in North Carolina. I had never been in North Carolina in my life. I knew Tracy and Lana's name. I knew that Tracy was in a wedding dress. And I knew that they were all on the run. And I woke up. And I knew the lion was going to be. The, the catalyst that would change their lives. I knew everything in this dream, and I woke up as startled as I ever, I mean, I didn't know if I'd seen it, if I'd been there, if it had just happened. It really took me a while to come out of the dream, and then I thought, oh my gosh, it's my next book. This is, now this is amazing for a number of reasons. One, most people, when they wake up from their dream, they can't really recall it, let alone sit down and write almost 300 pages about it. Do you have this often? Are you really one of these people who's able to do that? I, I never had this happen. So it came from God. Never, in it, my life, you know, it, I think I was really around the bend about something that was going on in my life, and I'm thinking, 
this is going to last a while, how am I going to get through it? And I went to sleep and I had the dream. And the whole time this little issue was playing out in my life, I was living in the story instead of in my life. And it was like I said, oh, I need a gift. I need a, I need a story to be in. And I was so happy there. And also, Marcel, my lion, yes. I mean, in the course of this, he is a lion, but in the course of the story, he's fire, power, shrink, dance partner, beloved, and many roles he plays, facilitator, and um, I think I needed to dream a lion. I needed, I needed Marcel in my life. Huh. And, and uh, you know, it would be rude, of course, to ask you what was going on in your life, but you've already kind of told me, and now I see that Marcel really is the ultimate male. Yes, I think he is. So he is, yeah, and you know, when you said, I mean, this is a story with three heroines, and, and one of the great things about writing books, as opposed to movies, which I also love to write, is that books can be about women more than movies can. I mean, movies are mostly about the lives of men. Huh. Women are smaller roles in them. Yeah, I think that there were there were thirteen percent of movies last year had female protagonists. In them. Okay, that is a pretty low figure. So uh, it, to tell a story about women's lives and what women, what's on women's minds, or a women adventure story, which this is, that you know, I'm lucky to have books as an outlet. No, that that's very interesting because um, uh, as I've been doing this show and speaking to a lot of different authors, without a doubt. Uh, books that have female protagonists or appeal to women are, I mean, multitudes above uh, success and sales of, uh, of other types of genres. And I had never thought that, you know, in movies it is exactly the inverse. Why do you think that is? Well, in the movie business, they believe that, that men drive the ticket prices. Even though women buy more tickets, they actually do buy more tickets. They believe that men make the decisions. It doesn't matter how much evidence there is, it doesn't matter the bridesmaids or the help or any of it, they still insist on believing that a movie should appeal to a, a boy between the ages of 14 and 18. Huh. So it's really sad to think about it from both ends of the spectrum um, that because men like to read, or maybe we don't. Maybe, uh, maybe it's true, maybe we're just dumb. Well, I don't think it's whether men like to read, but we know women do. We know women buy books and that they love to read, and so uh, as a female author who thinks about the lives of women, I can just go wild and write them, and that gives me great pleasure. And I can be funny, and that's the other thing. I, I like to find this sweet spot between pain and humor, and I, I, in a book I have a lot of controls. I can move between, if I keep it real, I can move as far as I want into comedy and then move back into the other, into the sad stuff. I like that. I like the control. <laughs> well, you got it. And, uh, and it, you know, now that I know a little bit more of the backstory, um, you, wow, you're a huge, I mean, we already know this, of course, but really the, the love affair there with Marcel the Lion, that's, uh, that's very, very deep. Now that I'm thinking about all the, the different aspects of what a lion can actually mean to a woman, um, this really sets, sets down the relationship in a way that, that well, that you dreamed about in this case. I was so nervous about, I wrote this, but, and even though Marcel is a, my gosh, he plays such a big role, I mean, he's really, he and Rita have a love story, and he in some way really saves Lana's life, and he makes Tracy's life, she does something which has a huge impact on Tracy's life, and, but I was very concerned that it be a lion, not that it ever break that, and I had no idea if I was doing that, so I sent the book off to a lion expert in the San Diego Wild Animal Park, and I was a wreck about this. And there is a scene that you may remember where the first time Rita connects with Marcel, she washes her hair in shampoo that smells really good. She's never used anything but Prell, but now she's like branching out. And, uh, and she sits in front of Marcel, and he starts to sniff her hair, and he loves it. And I thought, oh my gosh, I thought this woman was just, this lion expert was just going to nail me on this. And she said, that is so perfect. She said, because lions in captivity are scent deprived, S C E N T, scent deprived, and we spray air freshener around them to make them happy. So the fact that I had imagined this and that this would be the first connection, she said, that's exactly right. And she said, also, lions are extremely social, as opposed to, let's say, if I'd been stupid enough to write a tiger or a leopard. And so, um, so she said that uh, 
they, they will rub it, if they love you, they will bump you when they're walking with you, or if you sit down, they will lie next to you and, gr and sit close enough that your body's great. So everything that I imagined would be this relationship was completely within the ballpark of reality. So having written this, have you uh, had any personal experiences with lions uh, since? I, I have never touched a lion, no. <laughs> <laughs> no frame like that. But I think that when you, um, I think that if you want to change your life, and I think that these women have to change their lives since their lives have not been going right, uh, you have to get in the cage with a lion. And I think when I wrote this book, I was getting in the cage with a lion. Do you feel that there's some, uh, certainly for your audience, that there's some kind of subliminal message about what you really should be looking for in a relationship? Did, 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 do you have that feeling like that came out of it? Oh, no, only oh, because Marcel's such a perfect partner. Um, uh, but it could, could be, could be. Um, and um, there is another love story. There are actually two other love stories in it. Uh, I think. I don't think I was giving a message. I just think I was trying to tell a really good story about women and that, but it is about how you need to change your lives. And, and, and animals, do you have an animal? Uh, I've had many, currently no, but I've had many, many animals of all forms. Well, when I had got a dog, and I'm a stepmother, and every stepmother should get a dog because it's nice to have someone in the house that loves you. So, um, Besides your I, husband, right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and so I got this dog, and I never had had a dog. I never had a pet. I grew up in a petless family, except for two turtles. And there was something powerful about having this. I didn't understand how much peace they bring, how funny they are, how much they can complete things, how they seem to have a relationship to the world, which makes you think that the world has more magic in it than you originally thought, just because you're always sort of thinking of, when you see them, you think about well, what do they understand, what don't they understand, what's possible, and so I think that a animals, you know, have a power for me and a peace for me that I was trying to convey in this in this story. But mainly, I, just, I like to keep you turning the pages, and I really like to create characters that I think you really can relate to, that you want, that you want to be with, that you want to make your friends. and. That motivates me, a good story, and that idea. Well, it, it, well you certainly succeeded at that, and, as, and I, I just power paged right through it because it really was just fun to see what was going to happen next. A uh, couple of, you know, nice little interesting sex bits in there, which I always enjoy from a woman's yeah, perspective. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Always <laughs> love that, and you can never, give me more, give me more of that, love it. And, uh, but also, it, it kind of gave me your insight into um, women's relationships among themselves. We kind of start out uh, our talk here, is that, yeah, they can be best friends, but there's all, there may always be something that's hidden, which from a male perspective, we kind of consider, oh, well, you know, women tell each other everything, their deepest, darkest secrets, they know everything, but it's really not entirely true. No, sisterhood is complicated. I mean, you know, I'm one of I'm one of four sisters, and um, I've always collaborated with my sister Nora on movies and things like that and plays. So I, I don't think I could have written this if I didn't know what it was like to be a sister. And I think that there's no one you can depend on more, and yet there's always sometimes there's not a level of trust that's going on. Sometimes there's distrust. Sometimes there's competition. There's one that has. I mean, Lana is the alpha. Uh, sister basically to Tracy, even though they're not actually sisters, but she's the alpha friend. Mm -hmm. And so how is Tracy going to find her own way if she lets Lana make those choices? And I think we settle into roles like that and we have to, how do we shift them? How do we change them? What can happen to make that take place? Have you by any chance seen the uh, the new HBO series, Girls? Have you seen that? I certainly have. I watch it regularly. What do you, what do you, you like that? Well, I think it's very talented. I, I think Lena Dunham is really talented, but it is very depressing. It, it has I mean, the, the self-esteem issues are so deep uh, that it upsets me sometimes to watch it. Yeah, because I watch it with my fiance, and and she I mean, loves it. She she thinks it's you know just she's oh this is so realistic. I'm like really. 
that's you know wow are you kidding me this is how you guys are amongst yourselves that, that doesn't feel right i mean guys it just like oh. very sad it does feel sad there's a sort of sadness underneath it but i do think she she has she's honest she's an honest writer so um the uh, the, in, the inspiration for the line is in uh, came from your dream um, d d what was the inspiration for You've Got Mail? Was that literally the You've Got Mail sound from America Online back in the day? Uh, no, You've Got Mail is based on a famous movie called The Shop Around the Corner and Jimmy Stewart and it is it's a fantastic film but it's about two people in a jewelry store who are pen pals but hate each other in the store and when we, re Nora and I reimagined it, we imagined it as a, a book, she has a children's bookstore and he has a, one of those mega bookstores. It was in, when we wrote it, it was at the time when Barnes and Noble was putting everyone out of business and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, pre-Amazon. And, uh, and, and we wanted her to have a small store. We always love children's books, both of us. And we always try to find something in our movies that's a shared passion. So we, made her children's book, uh, and Ryan a children's book owner, store owner. Having been so successful in, in uh, the writing business, uh, how do you feel about the state of the industry today? You just mentioned Amazon, Barnes & Noble going out of business, you know, what, uh, or, or firing people. What, how do you feel, what, do you see a future and what would it be for, for books in general? Well, there must be a future, you wouldn't have this show. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not making any money on it, Delia. I'm just, I just like getting free books, so. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, obviously people are reading, but, you know, this is. No, no, no. I mean, look, this is all another way to connect, right? I mean, uh, you would never have had a, uh, an app on your computer where you can talk to authors. It's very, that's very exciting. So there's some things that are great. It means that the word gets out in different ways. The Kindle and the, you know, the Nook, they're all here to stay, and then. You read on iPads and everything. But I think, I just hope people keep loving stories. Because if you really love stories, you'll keep reading books. And that, you know, it's really important. But there's no question that no one quite knows what it's going to shake out. Well, it's, it, it, to me, it's a, just as an observer of media in general, um, I find it in one way um, very disturbing because I see where television is moving. Television is moving towards storytelling, but they're taking a track of what is then now called reality television. We try to place real people into which is uh, what they call it unscripted, but it is scripted uh, one way or the other, whether you do it on on the set or uh, in editing. Um, it's disturbing because I feel the stories are poor in quality and intricacy and it just seems like it's become such a bubblegum mechanism that people just like you know sitting back whereas you know I, I would so much rather read this than you know three hours of the Kardashian channel you know it's 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 worrisome yeah I guess it is I mean I don't I don't really watch the Kardashians and I don't watch I don't watch that much reality I, I like the you, I like the next Food Network star. <laughs> I like, uh, although it's a little weird this year, and I went through a big um, Project Runway phase. But basically, I'm not really interested in that in reality shows. But some of television is kind of great. I mean, some. I mean, The Wire. Did you ever see The Wire? There's yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. It, I mean, television allows more complex characters. It allows more negative characters, and movies are really becoming extremely big franchise things. I mean. It's, this Avengers thing, you know, which is you know four comic book characters and it's a huge movie. It, it means that smaller movies, more intimate stories, even more intimate adventure stories, aren't really you know going to get made. I don't, I don't know. It, it, there's a lot more choice, but for some reason, you can just keep flipping those dials and never finding anything you want to watch. It's yeah, weird, isn't it? You wrote a, a great uh, op-ed in the New York Times, which made the rounds. And it went viral on the internet, and, and I didn't even know that you had written it. But I saw the uh, uh, you know the basic premise was: if you're a driver, don't lose your keys; if you're a banker, don't lose uh, our money. Uh, which is a great piece. Now, do you just send that into the New York Times, and they go, "Oh, Daily Efron," oh, and they publish it? How does that work? Or do they ask you to, to to write something? Do you have some kind of ongoing agreement with them? 
Um, no, I, I wrote a piece about, uh, I don't know, six months ago about my dog. I hit by a car in New York, and I and everyone was incredibly wonderful to me about it. I mean, the people on the street took the dog to the hospital. They would, she was with a dog owner. So I wrote this piece about that, and I sent it in to her. Uh, someone told me who the editor was, and I sent it, and she ran it. And since then, she's been running my pieces, and I have written a number of pieces about the banks. Because our, our local bank, which charges that 0.01% interest on its savings account, and keeps asking, what can I do for you every time I walk in the door? <laughs> and, and then they told my husband that he wasn't a signatory on the account that he had for 30 years, and they, that the computer lost his name. And I mean, they're just so incompetent, the banks. They're incredible. So I've written a series on that. I wrote about being name uh my... my, uh, my uh, Dot com, GloriaEverett.com was name jacked and I got a bath by suing in Swiss court with a Milwaukee lawyer or something. So okay, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I like to write, you know, every so often something happens in my life and I think, oh, I can write about this and try to make sense of it. And the, and the Times has been great about taking it. You know, one of the things I wanted to say about my book, though, uh, you know, I said it took place in North Carolina. Well, and I'd never been there. Well, I went down there after I wrote the two drafts, and there's this moment when the line, when she, Rita wants the line to have this tree with no leaves, and, and I mean, she wants them to have a tree. She's never had a tree before, and she's going past the field, and there's this tree that looks more like a sculpture. It just has no leaves at all. It's just it was struck by lightning. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I would wake up in the morning in this area of North Carolina, and I would just put, you know take back roads into the uh, GPS with a random destination. And I'm driving down this rural road and there in this field is a tree that I had written. Exactly, a tree. It was huh. so startling and it was all alone in the field. And in the story, uh, the lion doesn't know what to do with the tree. When she digs it up, she has these guys dig it up and bring it back. So he just rubs against it. So I'm looking at, I stopped the car. I screamed first, then I stopped the car. Then I got out and a guy stopped by and he said, what's going on? And I said, oh, I'm looking at that tree. And he said, oh yeah. He said, some of the barks rubbed up because the goats over there come over and rub themselves against it. Whoa. It was like, really? <laughs> yeah, this book has real spooky moments for my I mean, it starts with a dream, and then I have some sort of, what do you make of that? Well, uh, as I said, the, this is how God works in strange and mysterious ways. Yes, that's right. You that's know, right. gives you and something. Feel, feel that. But often, you know, I, uh, I have another uh, interview uh, next week with an author, uh, I think it's, the book is called Headspace, and you know, we have this left and right brain where you're, you're, you're left, the left part of your brain does all the analytical stuff and thinking, and so maybe you're thinking about, um, you know, how do I get out of this, you know, this, something's going on in my life, the situation, you're analyzing, but then, and actually people with ADHD and uh, even autism, they have much higher right brain activity, so left brain kind of sees the trees, right brain sees the forest, and if you can actually let that right brain do its thing, which happens either when you're daydreaming or dreaming at night, you know, then all the synapses start to fire, and then you can always, all of a sudden see the big picture. And I think that's, it may, you know, people say, ask a question before you go to sleep, the answer will come to you, and you can yes. wake up in the morning. So, you know, but the universe isn't just uh, roads, you know, I think we've got electro stuff going on, on all the time. So, it, as I said, it came from, the universe, let me put it that way, that may be yeah, a little yeah, more accurate. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Well, that's, like that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful story. The universe isn't just roads, I love that. Yeah, but it's, uh, it, yeah, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, really, um, it's really nice how that came together, and I hope you continue to have amazing dreams, because I love, love reading it, and now um, I'm going to go back and uh, read some more of your work, some, some of the older work, which uh, hasn't been, because you know, when you see the movie, then it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So that, you know, I, I want to get some of the other stuff. Do, are you writing something new as we speak? Are you working on stuff? I, I have just been touring all over the place, so mm -hmm. I haven't got my next book in my head. My last novel was called Hanging Up for Adults. Mm -hmm. That was made into a movie, but I, I'm very, I like that book. That's, a, that's what I'm thought. Well, I love them all. They're all your kids. You know. <laughs> it's hard to say which one you'd love the most, of course. Yeah. Uh, the book is The Lion is in. Dila, Ef Dila Efron, thank you so much. Um, and uh, you know, whatever you do next, 
So more of that sex stuff because you know that that's great. The guys love that. You know, Fifty yeah, Shades of Grey is not just for, for women. Sex in this book. I just want to say that. To guys. <laughs> no, no, it's in there. It's it's good. <laughs> We're liking it. Not with the lion, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for uh, for setting up with Skype and everything. And I know it's the first time, but uh, really appreciate it. And it was a, quite a treat having you on. Thank you. It's really been fun to do it. So if you want a copy of Delia's latest, uh, the line is in. All you have to do is tap on the blue button uh, above me. Or if you're watching this online, the link down below, it'll take you to the Amazon store. You can pick it up from there. You will not be disappointed. Delia, talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.